All right, uh, we are in uh, a series in 1 Corinthians, and this is going to be week five of this series. We're going to be, if you have your Bibles, in chapter four. I also want to just point out that uh, this last week, uh, I had the privilege to, along with two other lead couples, uh, be at a retreat with five couples that we invited that are senior pastors of their churches all the way from Lafayette, Indiana to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and as close as uh, Kerrville, Texas. And these, were, these are people who are kind of learning and growing in what it means to be a senior pastor. And, uh, and so our very good friends, uh, Tim and Letitia Hensel, are here, and they're part of the leadership of that group, and I was going to have him preach, but I've had too many other people preach, uh, and and so Kelly was like, "You can't not preach again. You're like, you, like this is kind of your role." Um, so <laughs> one day uh, they're going to come and they're going to share, and uh, they pastor in Raytown, uh, uh, Raytown, Missouri, which is like right in the center of Kansas City, Missouri, uh, and uh, our Oasis Ministry, which is our ministry to children with special needs. Uh, really was birthed out of their church and out of their leadership and helping us navigate some of the nuances of that. And by the way, uh, we need buddies uh, for Oasis. I, I don't usually stand up here and plead for people to serve on our dream team or anything, but this is one area that's pretty specialized. And uh, if you've ever thought about being a buddy uh, for our children with special needs, I uh, would love for you to talk to uh, Liz, our kids director, about that because uh, we need help. We have, we're, it seems like we're getting more and more, and uh, and so we want to be a blessing to those families. All right, I got to jump in. I can't keep belaboring this because I went long first service, and I got lots to say. I cut out some of my message uh, for your sake, and uh, hopefully it wasn't the good parts. So before we jump into 1 Corinthians chapter 4, I just want to uh, recognize that we live in a time and a culture uh, where uh, we distrust authority, right? We live in this, in this cultural dynamic, this cultural time where uh, it's, it's not just the church, obviously, but it's spread throughout our country where we just have this hard time trusting authority, uh, many will say, well, that's because our generation inherited the legacy of the Vietnam War. Uh, we walked through things like uh, uh, President Nixon and Watergate. Uh, we went through the whole Bill Clinton thing of parsing the word is and, and trying to change the meaning of it and, and all this stuff. And we, we've kind of given up on this objective idea of media, uh, of unbiased media, Everything feels like fake news on some level. I don't know if you watch the news, but if you do, you probably find yourself thinking, I wonder if this is true, or is this just the narrative that they're trying to uh, shove down our throat? It's always interesting and, and kind of funny for me to hear news commentators speak uh, poorly about the, the, the media, big media, and I'm like, you are the big media. Like, you, like, you're kind of talking poorly about yourself. There is this distrust of authority that exists, and it's really in our bloodstream in America, right? I mean, if you think about it, I'm just if, everybody, if anybody's concerned that I'm going to be talking about politics or any of that, just relax. We're, we're not. Um, but there is this this in our DNA, in our bloodline. I mean, if you think all the way back to the beginning, right, it was like, sorry, England, no taxation without representation. You can keep your tea, we'll make our own kind of mentality that, that was birthed out of like this distrust of the authority that was over us. And even our forefathers, when they set up our government, they set up three different branches of government, didn't they? One branch actually has the authority to override the other two, and it's because we don't trust any of them. That, that's the, the world that we live in. That's the life that we're a part of, and there is this distrust of authority. And and it would be lying if I didn't say that it has made its way into the church. And the point is, is that there's good reasons to distrust authority, and there's bad reasons that we distrust authority. And of course, this attitude uh, has creeped in, and uh, for good reasons and bad reasons, within the church. We have 
uh, TV evangelists, you know, taking people's money, and we've got the Catholic Church and their reputation of abuse, and you've got Christian churches who are covering up abuse uh, and uh, worrying about their reputation over the victim, and it's just, it's kind of a mess, and and there's all kinds of, of Instagram accounts and different stuff about church abuse and leadership abuse and church hurt and all this stuff. And all those things are real, and it's, and it's created kind of this distrust in the church. And so all of that makes complete sense when Paul gives this explanation in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 of how we should view leadership in the church and why that's so important. In verse 1, Paul says, this is how one should regard us. And when he says that, he's saying, uh, this is how one should regard us, the us being uh, the leaders of the church. This is how, how you should regard the leadership of the church. And, and I'll just be clear up front that, that the Bible is pro-leadership. It's pro-authority. Uh, it says that all should be submitted to it on some level and uh, but that there's good authority and there's bad authority. And what we're going to see in chapter 4 is that Paul gives us these four characteristics of what good authority in the church looks like. And if you're a leader, these are the things, these are the characteristics that, should, uh, that you should aspire to be. And if you're not a leader or if you don't consider yourself a leader, I would just challenge that thinking. Uh, first, uh, if, you're, if you would consider yourself not a leader, I would say, well, those uh, people that you have the tendency to elevate as leaders in the church, uh, these should be the characteristics that you come to expect from them. Uh, because oftentimes in churches what we see is, uh, and, and this is uh, uh, in large part to some of the distrust and all of that, is we put a lot of faith in leaders who have high charisma uh, and low character. And, and so what happens is, is we get sucked into the charisma and then they disappoint us and fail us in their character. Um, more importantly than that, though, than like how you see your leaders, I would just say this, that everybody at some point plays the role of a leader in somebody else's life. Like if you're a parent, guess what? I don't know how to tell you this, but you're a leader. You're a leader of your children and of your home. If you lead a class, if you lead a small group, if you teach our kids down the hall, like these are leadership roles. You, you might run uh, the nursing floor at the hospital. That's a leadership role. You might be a shift manager at, the, at a restaurant. That's a leadership role. Like where you find yourself, if you're leading other people, those places uh, our leadership roles, which means that what Paul's about to say about himself applies to you as, it, as much as it does to me. Now, a lot of what I'm talking about is the context of leadership within the church, but I want you to hear it through the lens of how am I going to apply what Paul is saying into my leadership role in my context. So let's start in verse 1. It says, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So number one, a Christian leader is a servant of Christ. You might be a leader of others. You might even have authority over them. But your fundamental identity is not as boss or pastor or leader. It is as servant of Christ. And that means a couple of things practically. As a servant, it's never about his will or his desire, or excuse me, it's never about our will or our desires. It's about his will and his desires. A servant doesn't execute his own will. He follows the will of another. And interestingly, the word Paul uses here uh, is for servant is not doulos, which is the word typically used that was kind of his uh, his favorite word for servant, uh, it's instead the word he uses, hyperates, which literally means an under rower, like on a boat. <laughs> like if you've ever seen, uh, like at Ivy League schools, I, I think probably more colleges have it now than just Ivy League schools, but, uh, but the sport, I guess it's a sport, I don't know, of, of crew, right, where they're rowing it's, or rowing. 
that, that there's always just one person in the back of the boat looking forward and everybody else is facing that person and they're giving out the cadence for the rowing. And this person is the only person that can see forward. They're the only one that can keep them moving in the right direction. That is the term that Paul is using as leader, as the one who is, is finding themselves not as the person in charge, but the person rowing. The, the one that's keeping the cadence. And if anyone ever feels like, well, I'm in a place where I'm, I'm so strong that I can just row this thing on my own and they get out of the cadence of the leader, then what happens is it goes wonky. It goes off, it goes off kilter. And so as a reminder, we as leaders, in whatever leadership capacity you find yourself in, is we are just uh, under rowers. We're not the guy keeping the cadence. That's Jesus. As a pastor of a church, I'm just one of the rowers. I'm just rowing the boat and trying to listen to the voice of my leader and trying to keep in step with him. As we listen to the Holy Spirit, we say things like, God, what do you want for my business? What do you want for my home? What do you want for Lifehouse Church? Where do you want it to go? Because it's not about my agenda, it's about yours. So for me, for example, I know that God is the owner of this church. It doesn't exist for me or for my purposes. I have to hold this church with an open hand. And if I'm being honest, I was kidding around in first service, I actually, uh, our friends introduced me to some new terms this week. It's honest, more honest, and most honest. And it turns out you can be honest without being most honest, right? You, you can give truth, but you don't give all of the details. And then there's most honest where you're just kind of laying it all out there and giving all of the details of the circumstance. So if I'm being most honest with you this morning, I would say that there has been a season of my life where I haven't always held the church like this. It's been more like this. That it's a part of my identity, it's a part of like who I am as a person is that I'm the pastor, the lead pastor of Lifehouse. And what this means, what, what Paul is saying is, no, 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 as a leader of the church, you, you, you don't own the church. It doesn't exist for you. You exist for Jesus and you exist for what he's called you to do and what's in the best interest of the people he's called you to lead. One of the best examples of this is John the Baptist at one point, and I just uh, heard recently by a pastor who, uh, who helped inform some of this, uh, that uh, now we're just abbreviating John the Baptist's name. And I was like, I don't, uh, why? Like, wh- why can't we just call him John the Baptist? But then when you say the John the Baptist is, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. So now it's just JTB. Uh, so at one point, I mean, we got to abbreviate everything, right? With text and the whole thing. Anyways, uh, at one point in JTB's ministry, <laughs> Jesus was starting to get more popular than John the Baptist. And some of John the Baptist's friends, see, John the Baptist's friends, JTB's friends, uh, they, they were like, hey, are you okay with that? Is that, you know, that, that going to be a problem? Like, there's, you've spent all of this time building a following, and now Jesus comes along, and now he's kind of upstaging you. And, and this is how John the Baptist responded in a way that every leader should respond. He says, no, he must increase, and I must what? Decrease. He then compared his role of leadership to that of kind of being a best man at a wedding, how many of you have ever played that role? How many of you have been a best man or a maid of honor at a wedding? I'm just curious, like, doing a poll here. Uh, so not very many people. Oh, you guys should get more friends. Um, when I was uh, younger and all my friends were getting married, nobody really liked me enough to be the best man. I was a groomsman, but never, never the best man. And what we see in the role of a best man or a maid of honor is their job is to make sure the wedding happens, right? To make sure that the bride shows up, the groom shows up. But as important as their role is, once the wedding is taking place, they should disappear. 
If you go to a wedding and the maid of honor or the, the best man are overshadowing the, gr- the groom or the bride, uh, that's some sort of toxic narcissism, and those people need to find different friends. It happens, uh, sadly, but, but the role of a leader, John the Baptist would say, is like, a, gr- uh, like a, a best man, where, yes, he's there, he's important, he's a role but he should never overshadow who Jesus is. Uh, I read uh, about a, a famous pastor from the 1800s named Charles Simeon. He built this large church, uh, and God raised up this young man in his church, and he allowed him to preach, and it turns out that he was a better preacher than, than Pastor Charles was. Uh, I think there's a saying, uh, at least in the South, that he could preach the paint off the walls or something like that. I don't use that um, because I don't, I don't like preach, you know what I'm saying? I teach. Um, but he found out that he could preach better than him. And, and the problem was that uh, Simeon wasn't quite ready to retire yet. And so he had this... this um, inner dialogue and, and challenge of like, what do I do because he's better than me, but, but I'm not ready to retire. And, uh, and so he ends up praying and uh, he ends up turning the, the church over to this young man. And as I was thinking about that, you know, I'm, I'm 46 years old, I'm going to be 47 next month. And, and I was just thinking, I'm not going anywhere and I, I'm, I'm definitely too young to retire. Um, if I could, I would. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I don't really want to go anywhere. But I also have been in circumstances and circles where, um, where pastors, they, they don't ever trust and they don't ever put themselves in a position to release responsibility to the next generation. And, and what they end up doing is kind of holding their church hostage with poor leadership. And I just, uh, that's like my biggest fear. I never want to overstay my time here or overstay my calling in a certain place. And, and so if you, I just give you permission. If ever you're like, hey, um, you've dropped off a little bit. It's, <laughs> it's probably time for you to retire. Please feel free to, to let me know and remind me of that. Here's the question for, for all of us this morning is this. If you are assigned a leadership position... Do you see that leadership position as service? Do you see your leadership role as a place of power over others for your personal benefit or a place of service to others on behalf of Jesus Christ? If you're a boss, do you see it as a place where you could lift up your employees and be a blessing to them on behalf of Christ? If you manage a company, is your goal to produce something that, that blesses your employees and blesses your community and society and it helps make people's lives better? If you're a parent, do you see yourself as a blessing and as a servant to your children, to your home, to your spouse? Do you see yourself as Christ's tool to grow your kids for his purposes? The point is, is that any leadership position must be seen first and foremost as an act of service. It's what our roles are as Christ followers. This ties into Paul's next thing. He says, a Christian leader is also to be a steward. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. The mysteries of God here, of course, is about the gospel. It's not You know, all of the questions that we're going to ask God when we get to heaven about Adam, whether Adam had a belly button or not, or is Area 51 true, or, you know, like, I don't know what questions you guys ask, but it's not those mysteries. I'm talking about the mysteries of God, the gospel message of Jesus Christ, and that is a mystery. Not an unattainable mystery that we can't Uh, We can't understand, but it's this mystery in the sense that it is the upside-down kingdom in a world that seems uh, to reject what God is doing. Paul says, "I I didn't write those mysteries. God did. I'm just passing them along. I'm just the, the messenger. And Paul doesn't use the analogy of messenger, but he uses the similar one, uh, steward. That word is oikonomos. And it means literally a household manager. 
And what a great, great analogy of what leadership is. It's a household manager or of a pastor. We call our church Lifehouse for a reason. We want this place, this home, to be a place of life. And my job is not to own this life house, and it's not my house. I'm just here as a household manager. I'm just here to steward it the best way that I know how. In those days, uh, big families would often have a steward that would oversee the affairs of the house. He managed the kids. He taught them. He took care of the property. But but even though he was hyper-involved, they weren't his kids. It wasn't his property. It wasn't his home. His job was just to execute the will of the master or the father of the house. What that means for me as a pastor is I don't decide what, what you guys eat. <laughs> like I don't, I don't decide what you consume. My job as a household manager, as a steward of this home is to do my best to take the truth of God's word and put it together in a meal that then you have to decide whether or not you're going to eat it. Now, I love what uh, John Stott says about this. He says that that doesn't mean that a pastor or a preacher can't be creative in how he puts together that meal. No cook goes into the pantry and, and just decides, I'm going to do this systematically. Right, I'm just going to go through and it's like, okay, green beans, green beans, green beans. Guess what we're having for dinner tonight, kids? We're having green beans. And then the next night, be like, okay, the next thing on the shelf is potatoes and potatoes and potatoes. It's like, well, guess what we're having tonight? We're having some potatoes. No, it's pulling things from the shelf. It's pulling things from the Word of God and presenting it in such a way that it's palatable. So if you find yourself at times wishing uh, that you just, you know, had candy and uh, Hot Pockets uh, for, for your meal all of the time, I would just say sometimes the father says, no, you need a little bit of vegetables in your diet. You, you, you need some things that maybe you don't really love or like, but it's healthy for you. Th- that is the role of the, the servant and the, the steward is for, to listen to the Father and say, and to obey the Father when he says, this is what's good for you. He goes on, and by the way, in the next three verses, Paul shows us how these first two words, servant and steward, help address something that every leader faces, and that is criticism. If you are a leader of any kind, if you're a boss, your manager, your shift leader, you're a pastor, a teacher, uh, you, if you're a small group leader, uh, you are prone and susceptible to criticism. There will be people who will critique you as a leader. They, they will give you uh, constructive criticism, and they will give you terrible criticism, <laughs> hurtful criticism. And sometimes constructive criticism can be hurtful, and sometimes hurtful criticism can be helpful. Let me give you an example. When we first moved here 17 years ago, um, I was convinced as, uh, as the newly appointed pastor of this church that I was going to be Joshua at the ripe age of 30 years old. I was going to be Joshua to their Moses, that these Poor people had been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and I was going to come in from the northwest, and I was going to lead them into the promised land. The problem was is God didn't tell that to me or to the people. And so when I came in with this pride and this arrogance, uh, it turns out that people weren't a huge fan of that. And and I didn't understand it, and I operated out of so much pride in the midst of this. And uh, I had, uh, it was about a year in, and a lot of people had left because of my poor leadership. And and I had, I got one of the greatest pieces of uh, wisdom that I had, that maybe even to this day that I've ever received. And it was from my uncle, who also was a pastor, and he said, Ryan, don't be so naive to think that God didn't send you to San Antonio to pastor that church, not to change the church, but to change you, that there were some things he wanted to do in your life. 
And he was absolutely right. I didn't like it, but he was absolutely right. Right? There's, there's all kinds of criticism that comes our way. It says in verse 3, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. Why? Why does he say that in verse 4? It says, it is the Lord who judges me. At the end of the day, and, and I would say I would guard this very carefully how I say this. Because I, I think every leader should have accountability and every leader should have people around them to give them wisdom and knowledge and criticism and constructive critique. That there's, It's a super important process. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I don't answer to you. I answer to God. And by the way, if you're a Christian leader, you shouldn't be surprised by your criticism either. But at the end of the day, you answer to God. And, and I, if it's any sense of encouragement, because that sounds a little arrogant, even in saying that, like, hey, you know what? I don't answer to you guys. I could do whatever I want. No, no, no. <laughs> I live with a strong sense of fear that I answer to God. And that fear is currently stronger than my fear of you. And it should be. And, and also, you don't want me to just be tossed back and forth by people's opinions and critique. You, you want me to lead out of the fear of God and how he will judge me. Now, let me be clear about this, and this is super important. Criticism, although difficult, can be super helpful. It can be super helpful. And there's been times in my life where I've uh, been less than open to criticism and, uh, and rejected that for my life. And then there's been other times where I've been more open. I would say I'm more open to it now than ever. Um, but just this last week, I had someone come into my office who was thinking about, uh, thinking about coming to our church. It's pretty new. They had visited a couple times, and they, uh, they said, I just have this one a uh, bit of criticism, and, you know, usually my flags go up on that, but I'm like, okay, let's hear it, and he said, yeah, my criticism is that you have a, a police officer in your, in your foyer, in your welcome center, and, and I said, yeah, uh, Officer Javier, like, yeah, that we, we do, and he was like, yeah, that just really communicates to me about your unbelief, or, or about the church's unbelief, and, and that we don't trust God to protect us. And he's like, I don't know whose idea that was. And I was like, it was mine. It really wasn't my idea, but I took ownership of it. And, uh, and it, I just said to him, listen, I, it's not that I don't trust God to protect us. I just don't trust people. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we've heard of shootings in churches and stuff. And it's, it, it's the devil in people that I don't trust. Uh, and so just if it matters, he's not coming to our church. Um, <laughs> And I tried to steward that conversation really well, but um, at the end of the day, as a servant and as a steward, I answer to God for the decisions that we make here at Lifehouse, the, the way in which we present the message and all of that. I think responding to people's criticism, if I think responding to people's criticism will help clear something up or serve them, I will do that to the best that I can. But I know that I can't try to manage everyone's opinions, as is the case with you. And that's okay, because I'm the servant of Christ and his steward. So number three, a Christian leader is also uh, only a surrogate. Verse 6 says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us and not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one another, of one against another. So remember, as we've been through the first four chapters, there's three, three chapters and now the fourth chapter, this whole section, Paul is dealing with divisions in the church. He, he said that a lot of these divisions come from the Corinthians being overly dependent on some earthly leader. And Paul says, you've got to stop that. He's saying, my goal here is for you to not think more highly of any of us than what you should. 
earthly leaders are just temporary stand-ins for Jesus. Or even better, they're instruments in his hand. Ultimately, he and he alone is responsible for our salvation. God uses different people in our lives at different times, but he always is the one working in them and through them. You could think of it like a glove in the hand of a doctor, right? A doctor, a heart surgeon's going in to perform heart, open heart surgery, and what does he do? He scrubs up and he puts on his gloves and he goes into the operating room and he operates and he fixes the heart and he fixes the person. And guess what? We would never take a step back and say, those were amazing gloves. We wouldn't say that. We, we wouldn't say, oh, those tools, man, those are life-saving. We would say, no, the doctor performed an amazing surgery and this life-changing, life-giving miracle, and it's not the glove but a hand that fills it. And that's the same with God. Listen, there will always be famous people in the church They were there in the early church. There were Peter and Paul and Apollos and types of celebrities there in Corinth. And and there's nothing wrong with feeling connected to one of these type of people. There's all kinds of celebrity pastors and preachers and evangelists in our culture today. There's nothing wrong with recognizing that they had impact in your life. The problem is, is when you don't eventually transfer the roots of your identity off of them and onto Christ when you don't transfer your roots from the dependence upon them and only listening to their message and only listening to their uh, books and, and all of those things, if, if, you, if you don't transfer those roots to Christ, they will let you down. They will let you down. It, it, in the same way here, if, if you, if you are, are dependent upon me, I will let you down. And if I've never let you down, it's probably because you haven't gotten to know me well enough uh, because the people that are closest to me are the people that I've let down the most. If we look at how Paul starts this section back at the beginning of chapter 3, he says, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but uh, as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ, for you are still in the flesh. And he's saying this is because they're arguing over who is the person they've attached themselves to. And he says, Are you not being merely human? Or you could translate to childish. Paul says your dependence on earthly leaders is not a sign of your spiritual death, but your spiritual immaturity. The analogy with parenting here is great because as, for a while, as parents, we stand in the place with God to our kids. Like we're not God, I'll just be clear about that. We are not God, but we stand in the place of God when we are raising our children, especially at a very young age, when our kids are toddlers. Everything they learn about authority and care and the love of God comes through their parents. When our kids were younger, we had the responsibility, Kelly and I, to lead our kids, to stand in the gap, to be leaders and servants towards our kids and lead them and point them to Jesus. That's by design. We're supposed to learn and love and trust and obey God by learning to love and trust and obey who? Our parents. It's, it's why uh, smack dab in the middle of the Ten Commandments, you've got, four, uh, you've got four commandments. The first four commandments are all about in relation to God, right? No other gods before you, no graven images. Uh, don't take God's name in vain. Uh, keep the Sabbath or, or preserve the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then uh, the end of the commandments are all about our relationship with in this level, like our, our friends, our family, the people that we come into contact with. And right in the middle of that is this, this commandment about honoring your father and your mother. That's the hinge between these commands. And you could say, well, that's all well and good, but over time, like we're going to stand in that gap, but over time we want our children to wean their faith off of us And on to God. And if not, they're not growing up. 
They'll say something that might be a little bit touchy, uh, but I'm just preparing the meal, and if you don't like it, then you're going to have to take that up with your father. (laughs) If you have a child that's 18, 19, 20 years old, and their faith is in you to lead them, if they see you as their God, they've never grown up. And by the way, I think that that's why a lot of young people are leaving the church is because parents don't ever wean their kids off of their faith in them and on to God. And so when they leave, they have this crisis of faith. Your role as pastors, or excuse me, yeah, your role as pastors in your home, as parents, as leaders in your home, is not to let the church stand in the gap or me stand in the gap or our youth leaders stand in the gap and be God to your kids and to teach them and to wean them off of you and onto God. That is your job. And it is one of the greatest privileges that we have as parents is to help our kids go from seeing us and our faith to having their own faith in Jesus Christ. Paul says that's how we are leaders uh, that, that's how we leaders are with you. In fact, he calls himself a spiritual father to them in verse 14. He says, I'm writing you as my dear children, for I become your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I'm not here to be your leader or your savior or foundational in your walk with God. I'm just here to get you to him. I asked the challenging question in our newcomers, which we have uh, following service today, that if I were to die tomorrow, would you still attend LifeHouse? My wife doesn't really like this question, um, but I, but I kind of make it really personal. I'm like, if I were to pull my car out onto Wilderness Oak and take my life into my own hands as cars are coming at me and all of a sudden it's over, do you still attend LifeHouse? And I don't ask that question as some sort of arrogant, like, looking for affirmation, oh no, pastor, we would never come, you know, we would never, uh, we would have to go find another church because your messages are so amazing. No, it's not that. It's, it's this idea that you have grown up not because, uh, or, or you have grown up because you don't see me as your spiritual father. You see the mission and the faith community that God has placed you and you are you're grown up because now you're on mission and not about who's leading or who's got programs or where the location is. Some of you come to church because it's easier than going and fighting traffic at Cornerstone and CBC. I know that. But it's more important than that. This is the place that God has you, and he has created an environment for you to grow and live on mission together. And it's so important that you understand that because that's a part of maturing and growing up. Paul says in verse 6, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written. He's saying, who is Paul? Who's Apollos? I would say to you, who is Ryan? Who is, our, who is Kelly? Who's our worship leaders? Like, we didn't die for you. That's what Paul is saying. We didn't die for you. Jesus died for you. You weren't baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and Ryan. You were, you were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He is your leader. In Christ, if Christ is our identity, if Christ is our hope, then we acknowledge that whatever leadership position we find ourselves in, that God is just wearing us like a glove, but the saving hand is his. Human leaders come and go, and some of them will disappoint you, and some of them will disappoint you bitterly. There's bad authority, and there's good authority. Bad authority is where leaders use their power and their privilege and their position to direct people's attention to themselves. And good authority is where leaders use their power and their privilege and their position to direct people to Jesus. Which leads me to number four. A Christian leader is a spectacle of suffering. 
These are the least favorite verses that I have in the Bible as a leader. Verse 9 says, For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless. And we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Yay! (laughs) Right? Like nobody reads that and like, sign me up for that. I'm excited about being the refuse of all things. Just call me scum of the world. You know what's interesting is that actually is happening more and more. We live in a world that doesn't revere the authority of the message of Jesus Christ. And many leaders feel shocked or or just completely at awe when they experience suffering. Like God has somehow let down his end of the bargain. Hey God, I did my part. I was faithful. I did what you asked me to do. Now you do your part. When Kelly and I moved here from Spokane, again, we thought we were doing everything right. We came, we stepped into the role, and it was not easy. 80% of the church left in the first eight minutes. I mean, eight months. It just felt like the first eight minutes. They didn't all leave on the same Sunday, which we're super grateful for. They didn't like get on the phone and be like, today, today's the day, we ain't showing up. It was just this slow, gradual, disappointing event, one after another. And although I don't identify with this idea that I'm, I'm uh, poorly dressed and homeless, at least according to my wife, my daughter may say I'm poorly dressed, my wife does not. I I don't identify with that, but I identify with this idea that sometimes in leadership, people hurt you, people leave, people don't want you to be their leader, and that is painful. It's painful. But it's a part of what we signed up for. Paul says, listen, this is what you're called to. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And you know what? He lived the perfect life and he suffered and died. So why would we expect anything different? The Corinthians bought into something Martin Luther later called the theology of glory. The theology of glory is where you assume that God's presence on earth will always be accompanied by earthly vindications of success. What the New Testament teaches, however, has said is not a theology of glory, but a theology of the cross. The theology of the cross is the one who was the most perfect on earth suffered the most. So those most endowed by the Spirit are those who can expect to suffer like him. By the way, in verse 8, Paul is just being completely sarcastic, which just is my love language. He says, already you have become rich. Without us, you've become kings. We, the apostles, are fools for for Christ's sake. But you, you people, are wise in Christ. We are weak, but of course you guys are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. How do I know that's sarcasm? Because in chapter 1, he describes the Corinthians as this. Not wise, not noble, and not amazing. So he's just, he's just spewing this like, oh, you guys don't need us. You guys have got this all figured out. For us as leaders, no matter if you're in the business world or managing or leading a small group or leading a church, the reality is, is that we find ourselves in a position where it's going to cost us. A.W. Tozer says it like this, it is doubtful whether God can use a man greatly before he has hurt him deeply. (sighs) Or to quote Paul, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. 
The fellowship of his suffering is the only way to the power of his resurrection. There's this famous story about a guy named St. Dominic in the 12th century. Think of him like an early reformer of the church, and he visits the Pope. And the Pope is, if you've ever been to the Vatican, you, you are familiar with this, that he's surrounded by all the wealth and all of the splendor of this medieval, early medieval Rome. And the Pope is kind of joking, which I think is odd. I didn't know the Pope could be funny, but he's kind of joking and boasting that Peter can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. And St. Dominique replied, yes, but then again, neither can he say, rise up and walk. Do you feel wronged by your kids? Parents, if you feel wronged by your kids and it's painful and it's hard, you're dealing with disrespect, you're dealing with their challenging you and critiquing you and all, do you, do you feel that? It's a part of the process of God bringing salvation into their lives. Suffer well. Suffer patiently. Be like Christ. It's his vehicle for the power of resurrection in their lives. Be a representation and a leader in your home of what your children need to see in Christ. Are you getting unfair treatment or pushback from your friends that you're just trying to help? Right? You're just trying to give them words of wisdom. And, and, and the wrongest we've ever been treated in our lives is by people who we were just trying to help and encourage to do the right thing, I would just say to you, suffer well. It's a part of his appointed process. Are you a Christian leader, a pastor? We have pastors in our church. We have Pastor Jay, who's leader of Foursquare Disaster Relief. We get in circumstances and situations where people treat pastors and leaders unfairly. And the reminder to myself is to suffer well. The power of resurrection only comes through the fellowship of the sufferings of the cross. One of Kelly's favorite uh, music artists of all time died way too young, but he was a man by the name of Keith Green. Think of like uh, Bob Dylan singing Christian gospel music, uh, but with a voice. <laughs> there was a point at which he realized that as a Christian, as a new Christian, he was supposed to give up all of the music and to lay down his, his, uh, his instruments and just, just to serve, just to serve people. About a year and a half later after that, he said that God had told him to pick up his instruments like Moses picked up his staff and to lead people with his music. And Keith Green ended up writing some of the most powerful, spirit-filled, spirit-empowered songs that you've ever heard in your life. I'm going to close with this. Look at how Paul ends this. He says in verse 16, I urge you then be imitators of me. It's why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. Paul wants you to not only observe these things about his leadership, he wants you to become these things in your leadership of others. We want this for every leader at our church. We want our leaders to be characterized by these four things. And by the way, I love how Paul emphasizes I'm no different than you. As an apostle, I'm not on a different plane. I'm not called to sit in a position of privilege and power while you're called to serve and sacrifice and suffer. I have been called to do that alongside you. A few years ago, there was a mega church pastor, and I don't have anything against mega churches by any stretch. I think they serve an amazing purpose. But this one in particular, I have a little bit of an issue with. He was a pastor of a large church, and he said that pastors of large churches should not really work in the church anymore, but work on the church. 
And what he meant was that pastors no longer serve. They no longer live in accountable relationships. They no longer do the hard work of relationship building and sharing Christ and sacrificial generosity. They say, he, he would say, my greatest service is to be an effective CEO of an organization that helps you do those things. And I just want you to know that I fundamentally reject that view of leadership. We want our staff to model all of these four things to you. Servanthood, sacrifice, generosity, being accountable, sharing Christ with others. We should be leading the way in that. Are we perfect at it? Absolutely not. Do we fail at it? Sure, and we disappoint. But we should be leading the way. Tragically, that pastor that made that statement would ultimately end up abusing his power and falling from ministry. Shocking. Let's champion the culture, this kind of culture of leadership here that Paul is talking about, and let's raise up a generation of leaders in the church, the business place, the home, in politics, and let's lead like this. We'll close with this Last thing, I know I'm going over my time. This last week, as I said, we invited five uh, lead pastor couples to come, and there was three lead uh, leadership, we call them thread couples, that invited these five couples to spend three, three days with us. Not because we're experts or we have all of the answers for these new couples that are kind of learning and fumbling their way through ministry like we have, um, but because it was done for us. And it was one of the most impactful, encouraging things that Kelly and I ever experienced uh, two years into our time here in San Antonio, and it was exactly what we needed. Well, part of our time together this last week was everybody getting to share their story. And there's, a, there's kind of this, uh, I'll be very careful how I say this, because there's a, a protection of people's stories. I would never uh, out anyone's story, but... But there was, a, in a particular story, a moment in where someone had shared uh, that prior to becoming a pastor, they were getting in the preparation stage of planting a church and going into that role, uh, that a, pers- a person of power, a person of leadership, mocked them and said, you have no business being a pastor's wife. You have no business leading people. And it was this moment in, in this room, and I, I don't want to, I maybe already have uncovered the situation, but I, it was this moment where we all felt that pain and we all felt like that is not what leadership is, especially in the church. And I bring that up because I recognize that we live in a culture right now where church hurt is a big thing. And I just want to remind you that most of the time, it's not the church that hurts people, it's the leaders of the church that hurt people. And so, I just want to acknowledge that if you're here this morning, and you've been hurt by leadership, in the name of God, in the name of Christianity, in the name of church, they have used their power and their position and their authority to hurt you. It's not really my position, but to the best that I know how, as a leader and as a pastor, I can just say I'm sorry. That's not the leadership that God intended over his church. And no matter what you've experienced, no matter what you've gone through, we want to walk with you. We want this to be a safe place for you. And if there's ever been a moment where our leadership has hurt you or I've hurt you, Man, and if you've never said anything, we would want to know. We would want to make that right. We would want to apologize and and walk with you through the restoration because the worst thing that could happen is you sitting in a church with a leader that you don't trust, with a leader that's hurt you. I just want to acknowledge that whatever background you come from, whatever circumstance you've been in, we want Life House to be a house of life that is led by servant leadership who are willing to sacrifice alongside you and willing to walk with you through the things that you're going through. My last thing, and we're going to pray. I think this is the third time I've said the last thing. 
If you've not put yourself under spiritual leadership because you've been hurt, it's a problem. It's a problem. I'm not saying that you put yourself out there in a way to be hurt again. But there is, and I would say this to the men in the room especially, Proverbs 18.1 says, An isolated man will end up seeking his own desire and will rage against all sound judgment. We're not meant to do this alone. God wants you to be under godly leadership, and we hope that that's this place here. Let's pray.